get my notes so I don't forget anyone. So I am incredibly grateful for everyone who is standing here and the many, many other city workers, service providers, volunteers, um, community leaders who have been part of really trying to make sure that the city did not turn a blind eye to what was happening right at the heart of Boston, near Mass and Cass and in the surrounding areas. Um, today, I am joined by, and you will hear from, uh, Dr. Monica Burrell, Senior Advisor, who has been spearheading these efforts, alongside Dr. Basola Ojukutu, Director of our Boston Public Health Commission, and Chief Sheila Dillon, our Director of, uh, Chief of the newly named, renamed Office of Housing, as well as Boston Police Lieutenant Peter Messina of the Street Outreach Unit. I also am here and, and after our uh, cabinet officials and, and uh, Peter speak, we'll also invite my colleagues here from the City Council to say a few words after that. We're joined by uh, Councilor Tanya Fernandez-Anderson as well as Councilor Aaron Murphy. So today I'm here to give an update about um, the overlapping crises of homelessness, mental health, and substance use in the city, and particularly the humanitarian crisis that the encampments in and around Mass Ave and Melnia Cass Boulevard presented for so many living in and near and working around this area. The city working with our state and provider partners, including this incredible team at the Pine Street Inn, have brought online new low threshold housing and shelter beds to meet the housing and public health needs of residents formerly living in the encampments. As of last night, we successfully referred, I'll go down the list site by site in the number of people, 31 people to the Roundhouse Hotel, 24 people to Willow, 21 people to Dorm 1 within a newly created low threshold and supportive housing um, section of our city emergency shelter, 40 people at the Envision Hotel, 10 people to the cottages at the Shattuck, 28 people to the portion of the Shattuck campus run by the Pine Street Inn. And so all in all, a total of 154 people formerly living in tents in the encampments in and near Mass and Cass were successfully referred to housing. We have also seen others placed at various emergency shelter uh, locations and as of last night I was standing on Atkinson Street with the team shortly after 6 p.m. when the last tent came down. Throughout all of the efforts that happened yesterday a coordinated minute by minute hour by hour plan that was carried out by so many of our city departments led by this team here we saw that not a single person was forcibly removed from the encampments no arrests were made uh, there was one slight situation in the afternoon with a knife fight that took place that Boston Police very immediately helped de-escalate and people were safe the entire day and, and dozens of folks even yesterday were, help, were given help um, and access transportation to and from the emergency shelter or supportive housing that was arranged. We also saw uh, many, many, many <laughs> black and yellow bins that were filled up with belongings so that people's belongings could be safely stored, held, and secured. And I just want to address, I know, I, I want to just emphasize how different what happened yesterday has been from what we've seen in other cities or, or in the past, that this was truly grounded in public health and housing, working with folks every single day for weeks, and in the case of the Boston Public Health Commission street outreach teams and Pine Street and St. Francis House and so many of our providers for years to make sure that relationships were built and that people's individualized needs, their health care needs, mental health needs, recovery needs were documented, known, and then wrapped around with services. And so yesterday was a turning point for the city of Boston towards stabilization, towards recovery. But yesterday cer certainly is not the last, it's not the turning of a page that we are that now moving on from. I want to be clear that we 
did not solve homelessness yesterday. Right, the, the encampments are no longer seen in Boston, but the encampments pre pre presented a very specific and particular set of dangers to residents and to our city. It was extremely unsafe to live in tents, unhoused, no heat or running water, in winter in Boston. We saw fatalities over the last few years. We saw overdoses. We saw extremely unsanitary conditions, worsening health challenges. And we saw a disconnect between the resources, the housing, the opportunity, the health care that is available in the city and where so many were not able to, to, to tap into and access that. And so our approach from the beginning has been to break down those divides, to tackle the root causes of the crises represented by the encampments. And as of last night, um, the city's teams, along with our community partners, have successfully um, moved Boston on from encampments. But the push and the fight to address homelessness and substance use and mental health continues with even more urgency now. In the long term, we know that the supportive housing that, is cre that has been created will continue to help and support more and more people because this is not a one stop and, and dead end there. This has really been one stop along the pipeline and the spectrum of housing that's needed for recovery. We've seen that even in just the few weeks that the Shattuck campus has been open, some people who have been housed there have already moved on to permanent housing in just a few weeks. And so as spots open up in all of the sites that have been created that I've listed, as those spots open up because residents are being connected to permanent housing once they're able to work with the case managers, access treatment, get stabilized, connect with job search. Once they move on to permanent housing, much of this is outside the city of Boston in, in partnership with our regional partners, then new people will be able to access that low threshold supportive housing. And so uh, we will continue to have spaces open up for those in need. Um, we do see some residents uh, continue to be on the streets. I drove through this morning and, and uh, quickly looked around at what the situation was while the area remains clear of tents both around the New Market Square area and Atkinson Street. There are some folks still out on the street. I know our outreach teams have continued to work with everyone and will continue to provide services and offer housing and shelter for people who are in need to get out of the cold. Every single day that goes by in winter is a life safety risk for people who are unhoused. And we will continue to connect people to the available beds and uh, low threshold supportive housing as it becomes available as well. I wanna make a couple notes um, on behalf of our public works team as well. Since I don't, I don't, I don't believe they're, they're, they're the one uh, cabinet that has not been represented here this morning. Um, they were working all day incredibly hard making sure that the area was cleared and, and kept safe for everyone. Starting today, our public works team will resume nightly sweeping along Atkinson Street and as needed street cleaning around the New Market Square Triangle. Individuals will be removing any trash from the sidewalks on New Market and Atkinson that has been left behind and we will power wash the sidewalks once the debris has been cleared. Uh, that is weather dependent though. The last thing we want is to be spraying water everywhere when it's below freezing and, and then it will be a different type of hazard. Um, so we'll, we'll watch the weather for that. We're working closely with the New Market Business Association and Sue Sullivan to support the cleaning of private properties as well, fencing and other materials. And we're also reviewing the condition of public assets to make repairs and fixes as needed on the sidewalks, on the streets, and looking to clear graffiti removal and we'll be intensively around to support the local businesses in this area. Uh, this has been a remarkable coordinated team effort. I cannot overemphasize how many people worked incredibly hard throughout the day yesterday 
but in all the days leading up to that transition point. By the time I arrived at New Market Square yesterday around 8.30 a.m., the majority of people who had been living in the encampments had already been connected to low threshold supportive housing, already, had already accessed transportation there. So over 100 individuals had already moved out of tents and into low threshold housing uh, by the time the day started yesterday. And so during the day was helping remaining folks pack up their belongings in, into storage and access transportation as the vans came round after round, trip after trip, to take people to their homes. Many of the belongings, there were some questions I had gotten about why, um, why get rid of the very important belongings that people had, as, and we saw images of the tents being removed and some of the possessions inside. And so just to give a little light into how that process went, the team went in tent by tent, personally checking to make sure that no one was inside and working with every resident to not only connect them to housing, but to get their consent that whatever belongings they did not want to put in storage or take with them could be disposed of. And so consent forms were given to residents. Residents signed consent forms for their tents and whatever they wanted to leave behind to be uh, discarded. The new housing that residents are moving into or have moved into comes fully furnished. So the blankets that were left behind, the old, often soiled um, blankets were no longer necessary and the tents were no longer necessary because residents were moving into fully furnished homes with new blankets, with new belongings, with case managers to help connect them if they needed to purchase new clothing or obtain anything for that day-to-day -day stability to be able to move on to permanent housing, job search, and everything else that we all deserve and need. And so again, an incredible amount of work that was mapped out weeks in advance, planned minute by minute, and worked so closely in coordination among all of our city departments and community partners. Thank you all so much for all of your hard work. Um, I am very, very grateful to stand here today, moving uh, still swiftly and moving still urgently to tackle homelessness and substance use and mental health challenges in our city, but with a, a different sense of what's possible today on the other side of, of what we accomplished and um, with 154 people now living in new housing and more to come after that. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Monica Burrell. Thank you, Mayor Wu. Can you all hear me? I'm so used to it. <laughs> now it's stuck, excuse me. Good morning, is that better? Good morning and thank you, Mayor Wu. Thank you all for being here today. Our goal at the encampment was to work with each individual staying at the encampment and understand their medical and housing needs and offer personalized options. We surveyed the individuals staying in the area from December 6th through December 8th and began focused outreach to identify these individuals and offer them one of the alternative spaces that you heard the mayor speak about that had been created in the last few months. This could only be done with daily outreach that was based on building trust, trusting relationships between individuals at the encampment and the outreach workers. Not everyone in our original list stayed in the encampment area over that month-long time, and new individuals came to the area. We noticed an influx of new individuals, in, in particular in the last 48 to 72 hours. Individuals received notice of the plans for what would happen yesterday, starting back on December 16th, and 10 to 10 outreach then continued on a daily basis. This included last Wednesday, this weekend, and through Monday and Tuesday to inform individuals of the plans and assist them in these alternative placements. Connecting individuals to the resources and transitioning to the next stage of our work was a coordinated effort across city departments and our partners. I was on site for the entire process yesterday and witnessed compassion, patience, and de dedication on behalf of our city staff and our partners. We made progress yesterday 
and have continued to work to, and, and we have continued work to do to change how our city is approaching these issues. Talking to individuals staying at the encampment reminds me of the urgency of the work and the urgency cannot be underscored. The encampments were unsafe and unsanitary. It's very challenging for an individual to care for their medical needs in that environment. Without running water, wounds are hard to care for and become infected. Without toilets, heart disease pills that cause increased urination are often skipped. Access to medically needed healthy food is limited. The encampments created an environment that exacerbated underlying medical conditions and led to increased risk for other conditions, including what we had recently seen, cold-related injuries such as frostbite and hypothermia and burns related to fires. I'm relieved that we have been able to find placement for many of the individuals in the encampment. This is the beginning of the work and, of course, not the work of one day, but a continued effort to outreach individuals and connect them to supportive housing. We'll be reconciling the list of 145 individuals and reaching and our teams continue outreach. They're out there today talking to individuals in the area and looking to see who's unsheltered in the area as well as across the city so that we can offer them services. We look forward to returning to talk with you about our ongoing efforts in developing an intermediate and long-term plan to address homelessness and addiction. Thank you. Next up, Dr. Basola Ojakutu of the Boston Public Health Commission. I want to thank the Boston Public Health Commission's recovery and homeless services outreach teams for their hard work addressing this public health crisis over the past month. I specifically want to name who I'm thanking. Devin Larkin, the Director of Recovery Services Bureau, Jen Tracy, Director of the Office of Recovery, and Jerry Thomas, Director of our Homeless Services Bureau. We as a city were able to take an important first step yesterday, in large part because of the work that they and their teams have committed themselves to, along with all other city departments who have been involved. It's really the long-term connection with this population and their relationships that have been built that facilitated this effort. I also want to share what I observed over the course of the past weeks and yesterday. This was our outreach teams doing their work with ex exceptional empathy, care, kindness, and respect for every person in every single tent. I hope that this is a part of the story that's told and it's an example that we should all follow, including other cities across the country. Going forward, our outreach teams are committed to playing an integral role in these efforts across the city, and I thank them for their hard work throughout this process and in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Next, Chief Sheila Dillon of the Office of Housing. Thank you, Mayor, and I'll be brief. Um, I think uh, the work was summarized well so far. As the Mayor mentioned, 154 people were referred to low-threshold transitional housing and shelter last night, and in the upcoming days, um, and nights, these individuals will be uh, provided services and housing search so that they can realize permanent housing in the very near future. And I also want to stress, and I think it was mentioned, that uh, these individuals are taught, many of them are tied to services in the area, and those connections will be maintained. They're really important connections for the individuals. Um, in the upcoming weeks and months, these individuals will receive help with housing search and housing resources. The city, working very closely with our very skilled nonprofits, will organize and oversee these efforts. As some of the, uh, these individuals have permanent housing already identified, uh, but weren't able to make those connections because of living on the street, we'll move very quickly to make those connections and get them housed. And as the mayor mentioned, this will free up space and these lower threshold uh, um, housing and shelter options and allow more people to access them. So we're really hoping that this will be a very well organized effort in the days to come and, um, and more and more people that we see now on the street will be able to access these services. I just want to close by thanking the, our, our nonprofit partners that have done such an admirable job setting up spaces very, very quickly and I spoke to many of them this morning, 
Uh, they're welcoming people. They're already getting to know the people that are coming and ready to provide them services. And Boston Public Health Commission, Pine Street, of course, St. Francis House and Boston Medical Center, really skilled nonprofits that are really have risen to the occasion. And we all look forward to working with them on this successful uh, endeavor. Thank you. Next up, Lieutenant Peter Messina of the Boston Police Street Outreach Unit. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mary Wu, for your leadership uh, in this endeavor. Uh, just want to begin to say that it's um, no agency can do this alone. Uh, it was incredible uh, collaboration, uh, the partnerships between both uh, public and private uh, were unreal. They were fantastic. Uh, like previous uh, speakers before me said, uh, we do have some work to go, um, but it is, I am proud to report there weren't any arrests yesterday. Uh, it was a very smooth uh, process, and uh, we look forward to working with all of our partners um, moving forward. Thank you very much. I'll invite up uh, both the councillors, and we'll start with City Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Um, I, 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 I wanted to say that I am going on record to unsupport to this, these efforts. I think that it's a start. Um, obviously, District 7 has a lot of concerns about um, equitable solutions that will impact people of color, black people for decades, um, for generations that have been affected by the same issue. Uh, Mayor Wu has ensured me that, of course, that sh her interest is to um, ensure that all people are uh, looked after so that um, I'll continue to advocate for District 7 for how it impacts District 7. Um, I think some of the concerns about change, something happening as quickly, um, we see a problem and we say we want a change, we want a solution, and when it happens and if we're not ready and if it's just a beginning, we should probably support it, be patient with the process, and monitor it and understand wh whether or not it's going to be effective. I think as um, sort of a pilot, I guess we can call it a pilot, um, it, it's, I, I am really impressed with all of the work that you and your team have done, and um, I'm here for it, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to continue to advocate for it and work with Michelle Wu, uh, with Mayor Wu, I'm sorry, um, to do this work. Thank you so much. At large, Councillor Aaron Murphy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mayor Wu. So I have watched this public health crisis evolve since 2014. Many of you may know I had a loved one on Long Island in a detox program when the bridge shut down and got a call in the middle of the night that they were being evacuated. So yesterday was very emotional to me to see that people who are struggling, who need dignity and respect, need to really, um, we need to step up and support them. So I am happy that yesterday went smoothly, but I'm also going to advocate strongly to support the mental health and recovery needs of these people, knowing that housing is not the only solution, even though people do need housing and it's very important. And I will be working alongside, rolling up my sleeves and supporting the um, efforts to make this a long-term solution for the people here. Also, um, did drive through this morning. It was still dark on my way to City Hall and did see, like Mayor Wu said, um, I saw probably about 40 people gathering still, knowing that people will come back, that we're going to continue to monitor the success in the programs and the needs they have in the housing, but also staying down there and supporting people down there is something that I'll make sure I'm part of that solution. So thank you very much. I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you. Questions? So the first of all, the air. So the question was, what happens for the first person who tries to set up a tent? Sorry. Um, the question is, what happens to the first person who comes back and tries to set up a tent? So. Um, Right now, there's actively, there's um, outreach workers in the area, as well as patrols at night. There's increased patrolling, um, which if you want to speak to, you can. 
Um, the uh, the, the way that we've approached this and will continue to approach this is leading with public health and leading with the relationships we have with individuals. So the first uh, move when somebody comes in like that will be to do an outreach, try to fi find them an alternative space. If all else fails, then the encampment protocol is still in place across the city and we'll go through that procedure. But um, our goal will be to approach the person and offer them the support and services that they need. And I'll, I'll just add to that 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 has already been happening, even yeah. last night, through the night, even this morning as well. So, um, and I hear loud and clear from so many across the city that it was never just about mass and cast mm -hmm. as well. So we truly want to make sure that this is a citywide plan that continues to be implemented and that our efforts to be visible and present citywide, providing services, working with our community partners, uh, to do that outreach continue citywide. The number of people get out of there is significant, obviously, but as we pointed out, there are still some people out there right now, and that's not able to make up with dangers from them, dangers from people still in the cottage. How is that success? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, we there's a um, there's a difference between making sure we address the immediate humanitarian crisis that encampments pose as a safety and health risk for everyone and ending homelessness. So we are still very much working and um, working alongside partners like Pine Street. Lindia shared with me that there are 850 some supportive uh, permanent housing units, transitional housing that Pine Street Inn already operates in addition to overnight emergency shelter. And they have about 250 more in the pipeline, in, in, in the works. And so if you think about the number of people who we are needing to address and, and to really support in Boston, it was 145 people who were living in the encampments as of early December, 154 people who we were able to connect with services and directly place in housing. And we still see a couple dozen people out who we need to continue working with to try to make sure they're able to get into supportive housing and services. Um, but with 250 units in the pipeline, Boston has the numbers and the resources and the plan already in place where we'll be in a very good spot in the years to come. <laughs> You know, I, I I will defer to others here who um, have been spending their, their lives and careers working with folks on the ground who are in recovery, but from what I know and from the conversations that I've been able to have with residents who are living in the encampments even yesterday, uh, throughout the day, recovery is not a straight line journey, and there's a flow of people who will need support one day who take one step forward two steps back three steps forward the next day and we are there to meet people where they are and to make sure that at whatever point we can reach folks whether it is still out on southampton street whether it is at the envision hotel to take that next step into permanent housing that we are there with services housing and with an emphasis on dignity and compassion Conversations yesterday included with uh, a man who um, has been in Boston for a bit now, but most immediately was living in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, with someone who had come up from Florida um, in the last year or so. And we know that many of the residents of the encampments um, have had homes elsewhere outside the city of Boston previously as well. We are here to ensure that we can meet the need to the best of the city's ability, but we need regional partnership. We need the coordination among our sister cities and also with state and beyond to address this. But um, I know Dr. Burrell, for example, and, and Chief Dillon and Dr. Ojakutu are all constantly in touch, not only with their counterparts in other cities and at the state, but also across the country. And so this is really a larger challenge that we are looking to be a, a, a part of solving um, and, and innovating, but we will need resources from other places as well to keep this going. And that, that enters into the conversation about Long Island. Um, you know, our trip out there 
was that last week? <laughs> I can't even remember. Our recent trip out there showed that we have space and facilities. We need to figure out transportation. We need to figure out exactly which residents would be served, best served by services out on an island that does require transportation. Um, but that could be part of a regional solution for long-term recovery. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but what I saw yesterday uh, out as, as, as everything was unfolding was individual conversations, working with residents of tents or of the encampments to help pack up their belongings into storage, um, to get transported. Sometimes there were things that were larger that can fit in a box, like furniture or chairs that were also taken along with, and, and then a van that was coming and directly connecting people to their new homes. Um, there's no way to um, force anyone to stay in those homes for a certain period of time or anything like that, but um, for 154 people who had been formerly living in the encampments, that connection was made, that transportation was made, and the services are wrapped around, and we will continue to work with them uh, as, much as, as, much, as much, much as possible. Does that sound right? Okay. Good morning, Mayor. Domingo for Rosa. Domingo, uh, my question is coming from the community. Uh, as of yesterday morning, um, she did a great job, but we also know that there was a body found. So the community's concern, is this an isolated situation or is there a serial murderer on mass attacks? And we want to know, you know, what's going on because nothing's been said to the community. Should we fear our safety or should we be looking for more police enforcement around that area? Good morning, Domingos. Good to see you. Um, so yes, there was uh, there was one uh, body found in the, New in the Newmarket Square area. Um, it is a death investigation right now. Uh, that was, um, I believe it was two nights ago. Uh, there was another couple nights prior to that, and that's another death investigation. So there is an ongoing investigation regarding um, those two uh, instances. So as so soon as should the community be worried, and are you worried about anything? I am not worried about it. We are not worried about it right now, but it's still under investigation, uh, and more will be put out soon. But once once the investigation is complete, a notice will be going out to the community. Yes. It's an ongoing investigation, so we can't speak on that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having trouble here. Uh, the, on. Over the span of five days, uh, they're, they're both under investigation right now. Hoy estoy feliz de anunciar que los esfuerzos en en los días pasados era um, muy importante en, conect en conectando 100, uh, 144 personas um, uh, antes vivir en las tiendas en Mass and Cass, en las nuevas viviendas con servicios médicos y con, um, con uh, servicios de, de salud también. Es un, import, es, es un paso grande para la ciudad de Boston. Uh, no está um, la destinación final para los esfuerzos porque um, cada día es, es también todavía un, un momento para continuar el progreso de, de crear más viviendas, de conectar nuestros residentes con servicios. Pero es muy importante que en ese momento no hay tiendas en la ciudad de Boston para personas que uh, personas sin, sin uh, viviendas en era una situación muy um, insegura muy uh, uh, no estaba no estaba sana y, um, en este momento el plan para los pasos próximos es crear destinación en Long Island y otras posiciones 
como los residentes de la vivienda nueva podemos accesar viviendas permanentes, las posiciones es disponible para otras personas y entonces hay, hay otra posibilidad de continuar a expandir este impacto. was on um, Boston Public Schools and a uh, potential walkout to take place tomorrow, student-led, and whether there are plans for going remote given the COVID surge. We, um, and I'll defer to Dr. Jakutu on the, the latest numbers, but we are still seeing very high community positivity that is having an impact as that means that our school staff and students also and families are being exposed to COVID-19 and, and testing positive. As of a couple days ago, there were about 1,200 school staff across um, teachers, food service professionals, um, social emotional support staff, 12, about 1,200 absences on that day. And at some schools, it's near 40% absences. We are working school by school and monitoring it with, uh, I think it was three different checks a day with each school leader just to understand what their anticipated staffing would look like in the next hours and the next days. So far, we do not anticipate the need to have a district-wide um, remote situation because of staffing. We do have plans in place school by school. We have the technology ready to go. Each school has their reserve of Chromebooks that they've already been making available for individual students who have tested positive and need to therefore quarantine at home and so they continue our programming while they're at home and their arrangements for that. But the technology and the Chromebooks are already at each school should it need to be distributed for a staffing issue. Um, and we have plans and are working closely to, to have those ready. Um, I am thankful, although Dr. Ojukutu always reminds me, we don't know until, until we see the actual data, but the wastewater data does show that um, it looks like we may be approaching or that the peak may, may be past us soon. We hope that we don't exactly know what that will mean on staffing yet, but for now, I keep emphasizing that going, you know, closing our schools and moving to remote is a last resort, but it is one that we are prepared for given that there are COVID and pandemic challenges that affect staffing beyond our control. flyers and the signs that had gone up yesterday were around services available and numbers to call for services. So we'll continue to work closely neighborhood by neighborhood just to monitor and be on the ground and um, understand what the needs are in terms of individuals seeking shelter. For now, the message is not that um, we are trying to keep anyone from, from seeking shelter. Um, the tents were never the problem in and of themselves. The problem was that we didn't have the right type of housing for people who needed it in that moment. And so our focus is going to be on continuing to create that housing, continuing to get people into spots that open up as folks move on to permanent housing. Uh, but I'll stay closely in touch to, and if you are hearing anything of certain spots around the city, um, please let me know and we'll make sure that our team is there. Well, um, I hope, again, depending on when we can go out and use equipment that uses water without everything freezing up, um, I hope that even in the next couple days we will start to see a glimpse of what that area could look like and feel like. It is. It has been a very, very important light industrial part of our city with jobs for local residents, with, um, with small businesses that are very important in this moment um, and who have been struggling in the pandemic and, and, and before the pandemic because of the situation there. So our focus is going to be on working with the local small businesses, neighbors, uh, folks who live and work in the area to make sure that we can fix up sidewalks and, and address um, neighborhood issues that any, any neighborhood needs and deserves, 
as well as continuing to provide that access for patients returning to um, Boston Medical Center and the surrounding area for treatment so that everything will be safe and accessible. Do all of the housing units have the same sobriety policy? I don't know exactly the same, but they're very low thresholds. So there's no expectation that people have to be sober to live in, in, the, in the spaces that have been set up. Right. So the, the, the hope is that people, you know, there's an assessment, people arrive last night and, you know, over the last several weeks in some instances, their needs are assessed, they're uh, connected to treatment, and many are moving on to permanent housing very, very quickly because those resources were already in place. So permanent housing is the, the end result, that is the goal. So as soon as I, you know, resources are identified, people will be moved into permanent housing. So uh, some within probably weeks, others it will take longer. So we're looking at other options for this low threshold transitional housing, and we're also looking at additional permanent housing resources made available through the federal funding. So um, we probably will be adding more, but we, you know, I think our motivation is always to add more permanent supportive housing than more transitional. But Milton, I think, you know, as the days and weeks go on, we're just going to have to evaluate that and be very nimble in our assessments and, and what we set up. So one of the things we do here at Pine Street is we build or find partners to build affordable housing with support services. And that housing is low threshold, which is it's as barrier free as we can get it within the context of the rental assistance. Uh, and so we now have um, 240 units in the pipeline. We broke ground about a month ago with the mayor at a building on Clarendon Street. We have another 140 units, uh, 3368 Washington Street in Jamaica Plain. We are uh, fully funded to go on that project, and, and we're just uh, really going to probably break ground within the next month or so. No, they're not temporary. This, these are units where people have a lease, they pay rent. We have support staff on site to help people with everything from budgeting to finding a job to dealing with substance use uh, to getting people primary care. So it's, it's I call it, it's housing plus support. Yes, I, I would say that all of the programs, uh, you know, the hotel that Boston Medical Center is, is, has opened, our program at Shattuck, St. Francis House, the city's own shelter, not only is there bed capacity, but there's a level of support services that run the gamut from if you want to get into treatment. If you don't want to get into treatment, how do we work with you along a spectrum to get you there? You know, none of this is simple, as, as this team knows, and it's going to take time, and, and people have to be patient with it. People didn't uh, you know, people's life have been completely un up upended if you're living at Mass Cass, and it's going to take time for your life to, to get to a different space. Um, so to clarify, there's a subject, there was a subjective increase in individuals over the last 48 to 72 hours where we found that our out outreach staff didn't know everybody who was in the area. <clears throat> and some people did say that they came to the area because they heard of this event that was going on. So, you know, it's unclear. We'll have to see whether those individuals stay in the area or, or go back to where they were. I can tell you that we did help a couple of individuals. There was um, one couple in particular that I was involved with who we helped them find a safe place for the night, and then the next day um, we're going to help them go back to Worcester where their supports were and their family were. Oh, I want to add one thing on Soraya's question uh, also in terms of the types of requirements or, or um, thresholds that are available. So not only has it been an effort to create 
new low threshold supportive housing units for folks. But even in the emergency shelter system, I just want to thank our partners because even there, there were many emergency shelter beds that have now been uh, where the thresholds have been lowered as well. And so there's now a, a range and a mix of options for people and there is capacity within that system right now for anyone who wants to go in. Um, and I know Dr. Ojukutu's team continued along with our, our partners on in, uh, here at San Francisco, San Francisco House, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, continue to go out to reach out to folks multiple times a day to try to offer that housing. Sorry. What, here and the other. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Sorry. see anybody on the street you know we have a street team that's out in fact the person who runs our street team is standing right behind you uh, Mike Andrick who I, I want to call out in particular for the work he's been doing but listen we don't want to ever see anybody on the street and that's the point of having street outreach is to try and get people to come into shelter or something else you know in the past couple of years we've placed 594 people directly from the street into housing into permanent housing they didn't come into shelter. They didn't go into transitional program. And we're going to keep doing that along with all of our partners from the city. Uh, it, but it's a constant job. There's no question about it. But I think we're, we're, we are going to work hard to keep our street numbers low in Boston. I, I, I will share one number. Boston typically, about 2% of our homeless population sleeps outside in Boston. In San Francisco, the number is 55%. Uh, in Seattle, is 48%. So. We've done a relatively good job. We need to keep it that way. It's a reminder of how much we are working on all at once in the city of Boston and also how great the need is. There are, um, in this time of division and feelings of instability and all that we have lived through, we really have to provide clear leadership in the city of Boston because we have the resources to do so. We have incredible talent um, and we're building our teams to be able to do as much as we can and show what's possible in Boston that to, to keep everyone safe and healthy.